Currently, I'm saving about $400 a month, as well as making an extra $200 to $400 a month by using my solar, and I'm gonna show you exactly how I did that. I chose to do a DIY install of 20.8 kilowatts of solar. Half of it's here on my roof, and the other half of it is on this Sinclair season adjustable ground mount that I installed. I pulled all the permits, I did all the paperwork, and I had all of this installed by myself and with the help of some friends and some family. And before doing this, I got a quote from another local solar company, and they were we're gonna charge me about $140,000 to install this same system here. But the secret is I saved over $100,000 by doing this myself. The way that I saved $400 a month is we swapped our internal combustion engine, which was a Ford Expedition, for this Rivian R1S. I did calculations over the last few years and we averaged $400 a month in all of the driving that we did in the Expedition. And not because we're charging this from solar, this is directly paying us back by having huge savings and not paying for gasoline every month. I'm sorry for the fan noise here, but this is how I heat my house during the winter and make an extra 200 to $400 a month mining Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. This one is specifically Caspa, which is similar to Bitcoin, but also very different. I can do another video on the solar crypto mining if you'd like. If you'd like to see that, comment it down below. But by running these crypto miners off of solar, I'm not having the expense on the energy that it takes to run these because they do use a lot of power and they put off a lot of heat. So during the winter, I redirect all of that heat into my house and I don't have to use propane to heat my house anymore, which is an additional savings that I get during the winter. Winter. Normally when people get solar, all they do is they have a net meter installed, which allows them to send excess energy back to the grid and then use that credit from the power company at their house at night. I'm doing that as well, but I make so much extra power beyond what we normally use in the house because I installed so much solar that I'd rather get the direct benefit of charging my EV and making money from Bitcoin rather than sending it to the power company. I'm fortunate enough that my power company allows me to get a one-to-one -one ratio or if I give them one kilowatt hour, they give me one kilowatt hour of credit, but a lot of places no longer do that. And the craziest thing is you can actually do all of this off grid with no permits with the right steps. And I'm gonna have a separate video about that. But this video, I wanna take you through the step-by-step -step process of what I did to install this whole system on my house and give you a report of how well it's working for me. I bought all of this equipment on my own from Signature Solar and I'll have my links down below with any coupon codes available. They are some of the most affordable places to buy this equipment and I highly recommend getting it from them. I chose to go with Canadian Solar 400 watt solar panels because they were on a really good deal. I bought the Sinclair Skyrack 2.0 because I wanted a ground mount that was large enough to fit my side-by-side -side under, as well as be season adjustable. And I marked everything out on the ground using the information that Sinclair gave me. But I have to get all of the wires from the ground mount to my house. And that's why we're doing this 150 foot long trench using this ditch witch. You just have to make sure that you check local code. For me, my wires have to be a minimum of 18 inches in the ground. I rented this two foot wide auger and front loader in order to get all of the posts in the ground. This is by far the hardest way to install a Sinclair ground mount and I don't recommend it. If at all possible, I recommend getting these pounded into the ground because it makes life so much easier. The first two feet of the soil here in Southeast Idaho where I live is great, easy to use soil with just dirt. After that, it's a ton of river rocks. You can even see the auger is going at an angle now working around these rocks and that's making a big bell shape in the bottom of our hole, which is a major problem. I had to spend an extra entire day just emptying out all of these holes, getting these big rocks out because the auger could not scoop them out. That was not fun at all. I would not recommend doing it this way. I've run into the same problem on other jobs where we didn't have a post driver, but you just gotta do what you gotta do. This is our two foot wide, six foot tall sauna tube. We have to be a minimum of five feet in the ground and my kids enjoyed going down inside to see what it was like. This is a large sea channel that is going to support the entire Skyrack 2.0. This is probably one of the hardest parts of the rack because everything needs to be properly spaced, completely plumb and correctly aligned. There is a little bit of wiggle room with the Skyrack 2.0, which I really like, but I wanna make sure that everything is set nice and sturdy for when the concrete comes the next day. 
I'm just using this pole wood that I bought from Home Depot in order to stake it to the ground so it won't wiggle around. And then I backfilled the bottom of the sono tube by about six to eight inches of rocks to make sure that the base of these posts could not wiggle as the concrete goes in. You can see I'm not perfectly flat with my string line. That's okay because the Skyrack 2.0 has a little bit of wiggle with its tolerance to make everything work. My conduit is going to be coming up through the concrete next to this post, so I have to make sure this is all installed before the concrete gets there. We ran the 150 feet all the way to the house before the concrete arrived and got it exactly to the corner of my garage just in time. We're lucky enough that we can have the concrete truck get pretty close and it's really simple to have them start filling these sauna tubes but I forgot to grab a concrete vibrator so it's really important to make sure that you get all of the concrete into the nook and crannies of the post so that it holds it nice and sturdy and that you don't have water seeping into the cracks. We gave the concrete about 24 hours to dry so that way our vertical posts wouldn't wiggle while we worked on them. This large T crossbeam is going to adjust the angle of the entire rack. Every vertical post with every T crossbeam gets one of these jacks and it's supported by a single very large bolt. You can see all of these holes that are in the top of this vertical beam. Each one of those is a little bit of wiggle room in case your posts are of different height. That way if there's any issues while the concrete is settling, that the adjustment's already built into the beam. And just by spinning this jack, I can get this T-post to be a little bit flatter and more parallel to the ground. That's gonna make it a lot easier to get these Z purlins installed. The Z purlins are gonna be the left and right attachments that go between the T-posts and are gonna be the base for the solar panels to attach to it. I thought this looked really cool as we went back and forth adjusting this to see how this whole thing wiggled. It's most important though to make sure that the ends of your Z purlins are perfectly square with each other that way you get proper alignment for the solar panels and the funniest thing is that the solar panels are the easiest part to install just by using a string line from the very first panel installed all the way to the end of the array makes it very easy to mark exactly where the panels need to go and in just a couple of hours the solar panels were done the solar panels were really the easiest part it was the rest of it that was very difficult but the Sinclair Skyrock 2.0 is one of my favorite ground mounts, but now it's time to get the solar panels mounted onto the roof. There are a few different rules you have to follow for roof mounted solar panels. First, you need to be 18 inches from the ridge or the top. Additionally, you need one side of the solar panels to be 36 inches away from one edge and no closer than 18 inches on the opposite edge. You can go all the way down to the bottom of the roof. That doesn't seem to be a problem. But if you're going to put solar panels on more than 50% of the entire roof, then you need to have 36 inches of clearance around the top, left, and right side. Again, you can still go to the bottom of the roof without any problem. So we're getting all of our measurements and finding out where the base plates are going to go to get the rail and the solar panels set up on this roof. I chose to go with the K2 Systems roof mounting system for multiple reasons. One, it's some of the most affordable racking out there. But two, it's also some of the easiest to install for someone who's never done this before. As an example, this roof base plate has this adjustable angle piece to work with metal roofs that have different corrugations or different peaks and valleys. And it has this rubberized piece on the bottom to make it automatically waterproof. And it uses these metal roof screws that attach directly to the peaks of the metal roof. With this method, we don't have to find out where the trusses are on the roof, which makes life even easier to do this installation. They have multiple different mounting options. So make sure to check out K2 Systems. I'll have my link for them down below as well. That way you can get not only an affordable, but very easy to install system for whatever system you're using. They also have ground mounts as well as mounts for shingle roofs, metal roofs, whatever you're looking for. K2 Systems has it and they're all over the US. So by screwing this directly into the peak of the metal roof, it's now secure and ready for rails. We're still only in the first couple of hours of getting this roof system on and we've already got all of the base plates and L foots installed. And just like that, it's already time to start getting the rails on. I truly can't recommend this system enough. It's awesome. The rails are about 14 feet long and every time you need to put two of them together, you use this splice. In order to put two rails together, you simply pull one rail into the other side of this splice, slide in a T-bolt, and tighten it down with the drill. It really couldn't be any easier, and this does all of the bonding and tightening that you need to be up to code. This is the T-bolt and the flange nut. This all bites into the rail and into this L bracket in order to hold everything tight so you don't have to worry about it ever coming loose and it's rated for hurricane force winds. So you can use this in very harsh conditions or in areas where you have a large snow load. The L bracket also allows you to adjust the height of the rail. So if for any reason your roof is uneven, you can get the rails perfectly flat and level that way your panels have a nice even surface to go on. And we learned the hard way that you really shouldn't put your shortest guy on the team at the bottom, handing solar panels up. 
So we'll fix that later, but for right now we want to get these panels on the rails and start getting them all connected together. It's important that before you pull the panels up onto the roof, to connect your DC optimizers, your micro inverters, whatever you're using. I highly recommend DC optimizers. That's what I chose to go with as part of my rapid yeah, shutdown system and to make my solar panels make more yeah. power. So we switched things up here. We had Kyle on the bottom, who's one of the taller guys in the group, handing it up to Ian, who's actually visiting from K2 Systems to show us how to put this all in. And just like that, it goes that fast, getting the we solar panels up onto bounce. the roof. And while the top guys are getting everything bolted down, Kyle is down on the bottom, putting our DC optimizer stickers in place and getting the DC optimizer wired up. So the reason we spent that time on the ground setting up our wires is once I'm up here, these things are ready to just plug in. And now that wire shouldn't be hanging. It is not. Now, if I hadn't done any wire man management on the ground, I'd be spending a bunch of time working on this up here. So it's a good idea to run your main solar wires in your solar rail from K2 before you put the solar panels on. This will make life so much easier because then you're not gonna have to pull wires while solar panels are already in place, which can be a really big nightmare. And K2 is smart enough to use the top of their rail as a trough system with these clamps so you can hide all of your wire runs inside of the rail. Because as part of the code, you cannot have any of these wires touching the roof or you'll fail inspection. And the wire that gets used on the roof because it's technically outside, you have to use PV or photovoltaic wire. Wire. So make sure you get the right kind. And this is a JB3 junction box from Easy Solar. I highly recommend using this. Again, not sponsored. I paid for this all on my own. But all of our solar wires are going to run inside of this junction box. And I'm going to convert them from PV to THHN, which is an indoor rated wire that's much easier to pull through conduit and is only for indoor use. If you need any help getting this equipment or designing a system, just shoot me an email to info at minutemansolar.com and I'd be happy to help you design a system that's going to be affordable and work for you. This is the inside of the junction box. It even has a grounding bus bar so that the whole system is properly grounded. These panels go on really quickly especially with the four of us here. This is what the inside of the junction box is gonna look like. Because my entire roof array is bonded, I'm able to use a very short grounding wire from the rail to go to the grounding bus bar inside the junction box. And here I've used butt splice connectors to go from the PV wire to the THHN wire. And this brown cable is simply a Cat6 outdoor rated cable that I'm gonna be using for communication with the DC optimizers for the rapid shutdown system. To get all of the wires inside of the attic, we simply used a rain tight conduit connection on this 90 degree elbow and then use this waterproof rooftop boot that gets all of the wires from the junction box into the attic without there any chance of any water getting inside of it, keeping it nice and clean. This is called a Tygo tap. And the tap is basically like a Wi-Fi router for the DC optimizers and rapid shutdown controllers that are on every single solar panel. All of these wires run down into the inverter to the CCA, the controller, and this is what that wiring looks like. All of this information comes with the Tygo system when you buy it. This is the wiring through my attic, and you can see this conduit here on the left comes from the rooftop solar array and goes over to this junction box, which is gonna go down to the inverter. My ground mount is coming through this flexible metal conduit and goes over to the same junction box. But there's another flexible metal conduit right here, and that is for my off-grid solar. It's just extra wires. They're not related to this. We should always buy the solar stickering packages, and you have to make sure that all of these pieces of conduit are labeled properly and up to code, so that way you'll pass inspection and no one accidentally cuts into this. So we're getting much closer and it's time to get the batteries and inverter installed and get everything connected up. To make sure that we have our fireproof backing, we installed this concrete board directly into the studs of my garage. There's a much better way to do this now using the indoor wall mount batteries or even the all weather wall mount batteries. By the time of getting everything, I got these six server rack batteries that go inside of this battery cabinet. All of the wires have to be encapsulated or basically hidden. So I bought this extra conduit box and bolted it to the top of the cabinet and then drilled holes and put in these glands in order to pass the battery cables from the battery cabinet up into the inverter. And that's what we get to hang up now since the battery cabinet box and conduit box are installed. I got the 18K PV, which is a hybrid inverter, meaning I can do either off-grid or grid-tied connections. But this solar disconnect switch cannot be higher than six foot seven. And I got really lucky because it's at six foot six. I already had a bunch of two watt cable. And so to make sure it was long enough to reach from the bus bars inside the battery cabinet, 
I use these Polaris taps in order to put two of them together so that we will reach the bus bar inside all the way up to the battery terminals inside of the inverter. By using these glands that I installed, I make sure that I'm not cutting into the wires and it looks like it's gonna reach just fine. Solar is very daunting and it looks scary. In the end, I was actually very surprised at how few wires ended up having to go into the inverter. And it's basically your solar wires, which include grounding, your battery wires, and then your wires from the meter and your electrical panel. That's pretty much it. You do have the option to put in a generator wire as well, but let me show you how I brought in grid power and got connected to my main electrical panel. This huge gray wire is coming directly from my meter, and so this is gonna be my grid connection. We installed this long, tall gutter box, which brings our meter connection through the attic and into the conduit box, and then up to the grid connection point inside of the inverter. And then again, with some extra help, we brought in another set of wires that's gonna to go to the main electrical panel and landed that into the load terminals inside the inverter. Because I pulled all the permits for this and did everything on my own, I saved an incredible amount of money and you can do that too and live completely off grid or do a grid tied connection like what I like to do. But if there's any reason that the power goes out, I have a large backup battery and just as an FYI on a ground mount, you do need to protect the cables on the back and that's what I did with this metal mesh on the back of the panels. In the end, I installed 20.8 kilowatts of solar, over 30 kilowatt hours of battery and I absolutely love it. So this was a really long and difficult process for me, mostly because I was pretty distracted and I had so many other projects and things going on that I wasn't focused on doing my own solar. But I'm super happy in the end that I did all of this. Not only did I get a 30% tax credit as well, because I did all of this before the end of 2025, but now I'm saving a bunch of money by driving an EV, which helps pay for itself. I'm making money from Bitcoin and I'm saving propane by not having to use that to heat my house during the winter. Now, the reality is not everybody can go to this grand of scale, but you can offset your power bill, which I think is still worth it, even though the 30% tax credit is going away at the end of 2025. The way that I look at it is in five or 10 years, I'm still gonna need electricity and the power companies are still gonna be increasing their fees. And the demand for electricity off of the grid is only increasing, especially with electric vehicles, but most particularly data centers and AI, the demand for energy is getting so high, there's gonna be no alternative besides giving more power to those companies so that way they can run their data centers. I help people design these kinds of systems and get them at a discount. And you can get that information by emailing me at info at minutemansolar.com. And of course, if you want to see how to do this with no permits required on an off-grid system, then make sure you're subscribed for when that video comes out. If you found this helpful, make sure to smash the like button and I'll see you on the next video.